All right, I want to welcome you to this Physician Renewal Week session, which is entitled Find Growing Your Resilience. We appreciate the longstanding partnership that we have with MedMutual, and we thank them for their involvement in arranging this presentation and also with M Montgomery County Medical Society and our members. I'm Susan D'Antoni, the CEO of Montgomery County Medical Society. I appreciate you joining us today for this valuable educational program. I encourage you to review, I'm sorry, review all the other sessions prior to our evening program uh, this week. We also have them on Monday and Tuesday of next week. Uh, as you know, Physician Renewal Week was designed with your well-being and that of your practice in mind. Uh, so registration is still open for those sessions, and so it's not too late to sign up. Today, we welcome Lynn Hughes, who is the founder and CEO of Comfort Zone Camp. She has worked with MedMutual to provide programs on well-being, and she has a very interesting story and background to share with us today. So I'm going to go ahead and let Lynn start. Uh, we are going to uh, wrap up about 25 minutes after, so this is a brief session, uh, but I'm sure that Lynn would entertain your questions and other observations after the presentation. So thanks very much for being with us. Um, Lynn, please go ahead. Yes, thank you for having me. And talking about resilience is one of my very favorite things. And I always think it's such a compliment if somebody says, oh, you're really resilient. And I think about if you take a minute to think about the people you admire in your life, typically they have overcome something and that they usually are somebody who embodies resilience as well. And when you, when you think about when do you need resilience, we need it not only in obviously big times like the pandemic, but we also need it in the everyday moments. And I'll start with just kind of a funny story of a few years ago, I was getting ready to give a speech in the Inner Harbor. It was right before my son graduated from high school, which was like the longest goodbye senior year in high school. And um, I was talking to the mom, I was getting ready to throw a party with a uh, jointly graduation party. And I set my not one dress, but two dresses down that I couldn't decide to wear for my keynote speech. And 30 minutes later, I got off the phone, ran out of the house, got on the highway up from Richmond up to the um, Baltimore Harbor. And uh, when I got there, I realized I'd forgotten both dresses on my kitchen counter. And I was like, oh my, and I'm in shorts, casual shorts and t-shirts, and I've got pajamas to sleep in and running shoes and dress shoes, and that's it. So I asked the girl at the desk, and I'm speaking to 400 people, and I, I didn't want to let them know it, the, the, that I was speaking for, that I was kind of thrown. And the first thought is, oh, is this going to be a sign of how this speech is going to go? And then you start doing that self-talk, like, okay, you walk the talk, you're talking on resilience, you got to walk the talk. So I asked the girl at the front desk, I was like, is there somewhere I can get you know, a dress? Um, I, I'm a speaker tomorrow. And she's like, oh, for, Forever 21 is next door. I was like, honey. Forever 21 passed a long time ago for me. That is not going to work. And then she's like, well, there's a gap a couple more doors down. I was like, uh, I don't think that they're going to have any professional attire. So she's like, well, just past the gap, there's a Marshalls. I was like, ah, now you're talking. And so I went to Marshalls and I found not one, but two dresses uh, for $40. Of course, I had to get two choices again. And I put one on and it gave me a great story. And it was my resiliency dress. And I think that that, you know, it, it could have been a bad situation. Instead, it was a big adventure. I am not a, a bold person in hotels. I usually stay put, but instead it forced me to get out and walk around, get two dresses and have a great story. So again, do we not let the little things define us or do we stop the spiral and figure out how to bounce? Um, Susan mentioned my story and I'll just touch on it briefly. And I am from Michigan. I, I can talk Michigan fast. If I was giving the speech in Virginia, I'd have to slow it down. But you guys in Maryland, you can hang with me. Uh, that uh, I drink pop and I play euchre too, my Midwestern calling cards. But I grew up, I, I'm the only girl in my family. I had three brothers. When I'm nine years old, my parents were playing tennis. My mom pulls a muscle in her leg and hobbles off the court. Three days later, she died in her sleep from a blood clot. Fluky weird. It was right when they were realizing women over 40 shouldn't be on the pill. The pill was brand new. Estrogen mm. levels were a lot higher. So in today's world, she wouldn't have died, but in my world, she did. My father was broken, felt guilty that she died, um, started drinking a lot, became an alcoholic, started dating right away, got remarried within a year to a woman he barely knew. And then a year later, he died the day before I started junior high from a heart attack. Fluky weird, but it did happen to me. And I think everybody struggles with adversity and, and that question, why? So as a nine-year-old girl and as a 12-year-old, why did this happen to me? 
And I, I had that choice. I remember crying and lying on the floor and nobody came to pick me up. And that choice is, do you lay on the floor or do you get up? Even when you're a child and even when you're a grown adult. And for me, I thought the death of my parents happened for a reason. God thought I was special. I was supposed to use my life in some way to make a difference. And it gave me this purpose to keep going. And I get all the way to college and I'm like, still feeling like I'm supposed to use my life to make a difference. Didn't know what that meant or what major that was. And I did know I wanted to be a camp counselor. And I went to camp after my parents died and allowed me to step out of my bubble, uh, my grief bubble and get back to being a kid again. And I loved it. And so I wanted to do that. Eventually I went to a camp in uh, the Poconos. I was a camp counselor. My husband was a camp counselor there. Yes, we met at that summer camp, which I stopped jokes on like a bad TV movie, but it was a true story. And we love kids at summer camp. And from time to time, we'd be like, what are we gonna be when we grow up? Is this as good as it gets? Could we ever go back to camp? Well, I still had the desire to use my parents' loss in some way to make a difference and make some sense of, of why the, their death happened to me. So we come, there weren't any resources for grieving kids when I was growing up. Many years later, there weren't any. So we started Comfort Zone Camp. We were the first 501c3 in the country to do this. After 9-11, we were the first responder to, have, to help with that. And things just grew. After 12 years, we were um, a $4 million organization, the largest in the country. Looked like my path was set. And then I had a huge falling out with the board of directors. I'm not the first founder and CEO, I won't be the last. And I left the organization for eight years. And it was really interesting to be grieving something due to a life event. And I had run physician organizations before I started Comfort Zone. And then afterwards I went back and I actually worked for the Medical Society of Virginia for their foundation. And in the 12 years I'd been gone, I come back and I see physicians at a crossroads, somebody changed the rules of their profession and I see them life grieving. And when you deal with unresolved grief and it doesn't go anywhere, I believe it turns to burnout, which is largely at the root of physician burnout. And I could relate to that because for me, it looked like my path was set. Somebody changed the rules. I was at a crossroads and I had to decide, was that gonna define me something bad that I didn't have control over or was I gonna figure out a way to pivot and to bounce? So instead I ended up using all that life grief and my lens on, on grief to help physicians and created burnout and wellness, wellness programs for them and started speaking on that. And I loved it and I love working with physicians. And then eight years go by and the organization that I founded came back to me and asked me to come back. So forever I said, I wasn't, I didn't know why it happened to me, but I was okay. I hadn't had my Steve Jobs moment. And then all of a sudden I had my Steve Jobs moment. So I've been back for two and a half years and things were going great in the first year and then the pandemic happened. So we had to pivot again. So resilience is something that, you know, it's a lifelong skill and it is a muscle. Everybody can be resilient. Certainly some people are born more resilient, but it is something, it's a choice and it's a decision. It's a way of speaking, it's an attitude, but everybody can grow their resilience muscles. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how you can do that as well. I'm gonna to go to my slides. So this was physicians pre-COVID. I'm sure you can relate to this, the candle. Sometimes it feels like I'm burning myself at both ends. And then you layer on COVID and life grief. And we are all as a society grieving the loss of so many life events and nobody more than physicians and first responders. Then you layer on all the angst of politics of this past year or so. And what do you have? Burnout lasagna. I look at work burnout more like more of a burnout lasagna. Last week's workload layered on the past week's workload layered on the previous week's workload, all smothered on top of this week's workload. Just keep swimming. We thought we were tired before this, but COVID took tired to a whole new level emotionally and physically. You think there is an end in sight, but then there isn't. We just keep swimming. So what do we do? What helps? Resilience. And resilience is simply the ability to rebound after adversity. Stanford WellMD defines it as the ability to bounce back from stressful circumstances, citing it is one of the most important qualities a physician or clinician can have. So when I think of resilience, the people that pop to my mind, famous people, Oprah, Bethany Hamilton, Steve Jobs, Oprah overcame extreme poverty, was raped as a child, was told as an adult that she would never amount to anything in the field of journalism, or did she prove them wrong? Bethany Hamilton is a young competitive surfer, gets her arm bitten off by a shark. Within a year, she figured out how to get back on the surfboard and was competing again, has gone on to win championships, has gotten married, become a mother, didn't let adversity define her. 
Steve Jobs, he starts Apple, gets fired from Apple. What does he do? Goes to Pixar, creates Toy Story and so many beloved movies. And yet then he goes back and he goes back to Apple and what he created changed our lives every single day from the iPhone, text messaging, picture. I mean, I could go on and on, but pretty incredible legacy. When do we need resilience? Life transitions. There are positive life transitions, but they can be stressful. There are stressful life transitions that are stressful. So from graduations to death, divorce, aging parents, health challenges, a new job, a new boss, moving, empty nesting, all of these are examples of when we need resilience. And I, this is in red screaming letters, a global pandemic, we need resilience. If we don't, if we're not resilient, I think the person that comes to mind is Eeyore, poor Eeyore. But Eeyores, we don't wanna be in Eeyore, we don't wanna be around Eeyores, they are energy suckers. Poor me, this'll never work. You could be talking about how beautiful the sky is and they're talking about something that's depressing that happened to them and they make you feel flat, like a slow leak in a tire. Or pig pens, you know, they just have a negative force field of just stuff, chaos swirling around them. Wouldn't we rather be a Tigger? When you see Tigger, you sit up straight and you start bouncing. And the lens that they Tigger sees the world through is positive and upbeat, resilient. Characteristics of resilience, they pivot. They're optimistic. Resilient people find purpose and meaning. They have strong relationships. They're usually able to laugh because sometimes the situations are so ridiculous and what a stress reliever it is to laugh. And they're also able to forgive themselves and to forgive others. And as I said earlier, everyone can be resilient. It's a muscle, it's intentional, it's in little habits of how we speak and stopping ourselves when we start that spiral downwards to stop and start training our brain to look for the something good from something bad. And if we're not resilient, what are those consequences? We get stuck. We lose hope when we cross over from being out of balance and believing that's a temporary season into believing they are forever moments. That's when we cross over into burnout thinking and behaviors and losing hope is that tell sign. We get per personal health issues. Our job performance suffers. Medical errors, which of course nobody in your field can, can tolerate that. And oh, you can cross over to the dark side where you struggle with numbness and negative coping mechanisms. So what helps? Self-care, put your oxygen mask on first. Self-care is not selfish. If you go down, think about how many people rely on you from family members to your patients, to your colleagues. Also what helps, train your brain. It's really easy to focus on all the bad. What is wrong? How long is this pandemic gonna last? How bad is this paperwork? How bad is this caseload of patients gonna be today? And again, you can start the spiral, but what if you focused on what you do have? So for instance, when I had my breakup with my nonprofit, I didn't, I lost a whole bunch of stuff, but I gained new friends. I took up new hobbies. My daughter started playing softball, was really good at it. My son hopped on a microphone, started broadcasting his, her games at 11 years old. He's now at Virginia Tech and the only paid broadcaster that the ACC network pays. Something good from something bad. The pandemic happened. He was also the kid who gained like 40 pounds in college, yes. But during the pandemic, he came home, we called it the biggest loser ranch. I, of course, was Bob Harper, the nice one, but he lost 40 pounds. So he didn't have this, but he did have something else that was positive. So it's training your brain to focus on what you do have, not what you don't have. And these are actually from physicians themselves. What helps? Turning off news alerts on my phone, limiting how much exposure I have to news and social media. Unplugging, changing phone settings so when I am home with my family, I can be present and stay in the moment. What helps? Knowing my personal triggers when I am out of balance. For me, these are a testy, cranky feeling, a lingering headache, and trouble focusing. Do we know our tell signs? Is it a stomach ache? Do we start losing our car keys? Can we not find our glasses on top of our head? Is it headaches? What is it? And do we know that that mind-body connection and when we need to take a deep breath and slow ourselves down? What helps? Leaving the office at lunch to run errands, walking my dog, reminding myself it's okay to take a break. It's okay to give myself 30 minutes. What helps? I set times in my schedule to do things for myself. No emails after 7 p.m. Don't do work on Saturdays. 
being okay with never being caught up. And this physician said she still has a job. Mindfulness, mindfulness helps. <clears throat> and it, while it seems very popular and buzz, you know, little buzzword mindfulness, this and that, but it is so good for you. Even as little as one minute a day, it slows your heartbeat down, it improves focus. It just quiets that hamster on the wheel, that monkey brain. And if you can even work your way up to two minutes a day or three minutes or one minute at the beginning of the day, and one minute at the end of the day. Um, this is Russell w Wilson, who is from Richmond, Virginia, and obviously a famous quarterback now with the Seattle Seahawks. And their whole team uh, practices it. Their coach, Pete Carroll, is very big on mindfulness. Uh, so I really recommend that you can get free apps even. It's a really, really powerful thing to just slow down and be mindful of the sights and sounds around you. What helps? Forward planning, taking a vacation. And if you can't take a vacation, go through the act of planning one and just going to that happy place and thinking about where would I go and who would I vacation with and what would I do? It again, it takes you to a happy place. Taking a long weekend. I know some physician practices down here that they almost mandate if there is a long holiday weekend that you've got to pick one of the long weekends to take that extra day off and, and go and be out of the office. Plan a vacation. Again, just that planning is so important. Volunteering. Of course, this is a shameless plug for Comfort Zone Camp. We will change your life, I'm just saying. And you see kids blossom and grow and heal in front of your eyes. But if it's not Comfort Zone, volunteer. That gift of when you give of your time that you get back, the gift uh, tenfold of what you get in return. So find somewhere to volunteer and carve out even just a little bit of time, even if it's just monthly or quarterly. Another fun strategy is just to get you through the day, what are some quick daily pick-me-ups, but having a theme song or a favorite quote. So I've, I tape up my favorite quote on my, on my laptop. I know some people fold it and put it in their pocket. Sometimes it's as simple as just saying, serenity now, serenity now. But having that little mantra that, that, and I want you to think about it. And if you would, if you have a favorite quote that you go to, set, share it in the chat and maybe Susan can let me know. Another fun thing is a theme song. Back in the day, there was a TV show, Allie McBeal, and Allie McBeal was sent out to get a theme song and not come back to her therapist till she had a go-to pump you up, put your armor on theme song. So do you have a theme song? Music is such a mood elevator. And I know that you all are talking a lot about the arts and hobbies and, and music is such an important one, whether you play an instrument or whether you're just even listening to music, it's such a mood elevator. So having a theme song and humming it or going to your phone and playing it. And I know for me, um, for a long time, it was Blackbird. Blackbird singing in the dead of night, take these broken wings and learn to fly all your life. You were only waiting for this moment to arise. And then this year, I, my song is, um, I played just a second of it, is Rise. And that's our theme song for camp as well. And just hearing those words, I'll rise up, I'll rise to the day, I won't be afraid. I mean, again, does that, they put a little pep in your step and, and get you through those tough times. So Susan, do you have a theme song or Carissa, anybody have a, a go-to kind of fun? Uh, yeah, I, I love to listen to We Are The Champions whenever I'm feeling down, it like kind of pumps me up, you know? <laughs> Absolutely, I love that. How about you, Susan? And I Am Woman is one that I used to play all the time, you know, uh, when you were a little fearful, needed to get pumped up to go into a meeting or whatever, that's one I used. That's awesome. Anybody else have a theme song that they'd like to share? Maybe you could put it in the chat or you can um, come off mute. I know we're not a huge group. You could probably share it. Well, I highly recommend it. Again, those are two quick strategies. Even sometimes if you know it's a sunny day, just going and stepping out in the parking lot and let the little vitamin D sunshine hit your face and stand there and take some deep breaths. I know another strategy can be to take a long walk to the bathroom and take your time, just you know, slowly getting there and slowly leaving to just, again, kind of just to gather yourself. And then that's my contact information. I know that again, we're going Michigan fast. So if you have questions about resilience, um, I would be happy to talk to them. 
if you have questions about life grief, and it really is important to honor, you know, are we grieving and the care you extend to others? And what would you, what would you give to somebody who presented in your office with any type of grief, that same type of nurture and care, you really need to give back to yourself. And my favorite quote I will leave you is with is by John F. Kennedy. And it's one person can make a difference. And every person should try. And you try every day and you are too important to burn out. So please, please take care of yourself and practice these resiliency and self-care skills. And that's my presentation bumping against 624, almost 625. You're, you're doing a great questions. job. I went Michigan fast, didn't I? You did, you did, yay. Um, so thank you so much for that. I agree with everything that you said. I'm just real curious uh, if you could tell us in a few seconds, what kind of volunteers you're looking for with Comfort Zone Camp? Sure, we, um, we have mentors that work with the kids. Um, we have uh, nurses or physicians who give of their time to be there for the weekend if there's any medical care needing and also um, to dispense medications. We have a photographer, we have floaters, um, we have assistants who help with our support groups. We also need therapists throughout the weekend. So people who are um, trained therapists, uh, we would love to have them because we lead these small support groups throughout the weekend. And how many camps do you have like in a year or how many in this region? We, um, in the re we are up and down the East Coast. We're around the country, but primarily up and down the East Coast from uh, North Carolina up to Massachusetts. We have about 21 camps a year. We also have virtual camps that are just a, a half day. So um, as a result of COVID, we have been pivoting and we've created all kinds of new programming in person. We also have family camps now, um, as well as the kids only. So. And in 20 years, we've helped over 20,000 kids all at no cost. Amazing, Leon. Thank you so much for sharing your story, your own personal story, and also sharing these insights with physicians. Uh, I think that you know, it was a great presentation. Maybe we'll have you back to actually do more of an hour instead of like 18 minute rapid presentation. I would so, love that. <laughs> that would be great. Well, thank you so very much. We appreciate uh, your time, your insights, and we appreciate MedMutual. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much.